Okay, let us begin. So, uh, we s at the end of last lecture, we asked this question. So, given a set of propositional formulas capital S and a single propositional formula T, does there exist a purely syntactic way, which means a way which can be taught to a machine to determine whether T is a logical consequence of S? And one of the possible answers to that question is given by Hilbert style deductive calculus. So, what is calculus? Calculus is a set of rules and some axioms. As you all may recall, axioms are those statements which we do not question, right? And in this case, uh, these axiom schemata. Yeah, I mean, I am using the word schemata because there are different schemes and they themselves have variables in them. So, the important thing here is that, uh, I mean, you have to verify once I start writing down these axiom scheme, uh, schemes, you have to remember that these are all tautologies. I mean, remember or verify yourself. And I think nobody will have any objections in accepting tautologies as axioms because they are always true. So, why not? And the rule of inference, there will be only one. Yeah. So, what is that? Modus ponens or for short, we are going to call it MP. Okay, so, we will have this and in order to do this properly, we are going to use a slightly different adequate set of connectives. So, when we defined propositional language and then propositional formulas SL, then we only used two symbols. What were they? Negation and conjunction. But uh, just a moment. So, aaj nahi kal laiye, please. कल 12 बजे कल सैटरडे है तो इसीलिए ट्यूटोरियल कल होगा थैंक यू ओके सो नाउ टुडे ऑनवर्ड्स वी आर गोइंग टू यूज अ स्लाइटली मॉडिफाइड सेट ऑफ एडिक्वेट कनेक्टिव्स एडिक्वेट सेट ऑफ कनेक्टिव्स व्हिच यूजेस निगेशन एंड इंप्लिकेशन ऑब्वियसली देयर इज नो डिफरेंस या implication and negation are adequate you can check that what do you need to do as soon as you can express conjunction using implication and negation you are done because we already know that conjunction and negation they are together adequate yeah so how do you express conjunction using implication and negation negation of p implies negation okay if you say so I am going to believe that implication uh, negation of P implies negation Q is same as using De Morgan, it will be same as P conjunction Q. Okay, so any questions about this? This is the way we are going to do it. There is another answer to this question that is natural deduction system or Genzin style system. But we are not going to cover that in our course. If you are interested, please go and read about it in any good logic book. I have given you lots of references. Okay, uh, That has very few axioms, but mostly it contains rules of inference. Okay, So, what, what are these axioms? So, we are going to call them logical axioms. and short form is LA. So, these logical axioms, there is four of them. LA1 is the statement S implies T implies S. Can you check quickly? If you take this statement, S and T are any formulas, then can you check that this is a tautology? 
if S is false, then false implies anything is true. If S is true, then anything implies true is true. So therefore, the second part will be like S T implies S will be true. So this is a, actually a tautology. Yeah. So I should uh, well okay. Um, here I should write for all S and T in S L. This is L A one logical axiom one, but it is not a single axiom. Please notice. It is lot of axioms put together because there is one axiom for each s and t for each pair s and t right so there are infinitely many axioms here that's why we are calling it axiom schemata it's a scheme yeah s and t are variables they are not propositional variables they are formulas any arbitrary formula can be put in there and then still it will give us a logical axiom because as you already confirmed that this is a tautology no matter what s and t are it's going to be remain a tautology okay so this is an axiom scheme not just a single axiom i did not write propositional variables for s and t i said any arbitrary formulas s and t this one is a logical axiom Okay, this is called, yeah, I mean, I am going to write their names, although you do not need to remember them at all. This is called law of affirmation of consequent. Okay, so affirmation of consequent, consequent is S, T is arbitrary. And in general, in formal proofs, this particular axiom is very useful because it allows you to talk about any, like introduce any arbitrary t. Okay. Sir, yes. Can you only use l instead of s? If you only use l, then your proof system won't be strong enough. Yeah. So that's why you need the strength of all of them. I am going to write one extra thing, but that is okay. So uh, now, sorry, uh, I should add a u also here, yeah, s, t and u for all s, t and u. The second one is something which you can already see what is happening. What does it look like? Right. So, let me write its name. It is called self-distributive law of implication. Okay. So, S implies T implies U implies S implies T implies S implies U. So, S, T and U are arbitrary. Okay. So, LA3 now, LA3 is very simple. This is called double negation elimination. Name is simple, double negation elimination and finally we have la4 that is now you tell me what what it looks like contrapositive yes law of contraposition Okay, so, if you know the contrapositive of a statement, then you know the statement. Now, here I am going to give you an, an exercise, verify 
that all logical axioms are tautologies. Yeah, just so that you can confirm this. Well, okay. Now, uh, the only rule is modus ponens. But how to use these things? Yeah. Once we have these ingredients, how to use them? So, there are actually, uh, we are going to use induction to construct a proof a formal proof yeah and in that induction there will be two basic steps first one is uh, i mean base cases yeah first one is a logical axiom the second one is a non logical axiom and the only inductive step is this so called rule of inference modus ponens i'm going to write all these things down so, using this we are going to define a sequent. So, there, there is a bunch of terms, but once I ri start writing a for uh, an example of a formal proof, all these things will be clear. So, let me go to the next slide and start talking about it. So, oh yeah, uh, just before we proceed, modus ponens, yeah, so this is a rule of inference. So, <clears throat> for S and T in SL, yeah, I mean, here I am going to be a bit sloppy. If we have S implies T and T, then we have T. Oh, sorry. Yes. Here I am supposed to write S. If we have S implies T and S, then we have T. Now, I am being sloppy. In which word here? We have. Yeah, what does that really mean? So, I am going to make that precise by defining a sequent. Okay, given S subset of SL and S uh, and T in SL say that now notice yeah, T is a deductive consequence of S. Yeah, so read. T is a deductive consequence of S if one of the following is true. Okay, so now there are two base cases. Uh, the first one is L A. Okay, if T is a logical axiom, then T is a deductive consequence of S. See, logical axiom means a tautology and tautology in the Boolean algebra, where does it sit? At the top. So, deductive consequence also think of it as less equal. So, anything implies top element, implies or less equal top element, right? It is the top element after all. So, therefore, logical axiom is simple to deduce. You are deducing a tautology, so no problem. Yeah? 
then the second one is non-logical axiom. NLA is a non-logical axiom. So, if P belongs to S, then T is a consequence, deductive consequence of S. If, so basically, this is a single turnstile symbol, whatever happens on the left, we should affirm that. Whatever we assume, we should affirm it. You understand? Yeah, I am trying to find out all the consequences of capital S. So, in particular, everything in capital S is also a consequence. But it is not because of some logic. That is why it is called non-logical axiom. It is because of my own assumption. Right? So, non-logical axiom. And third one is, of course, MP. If we already have sequence S deduces S and S deduces S implies T, then we have this. So, this is modus ponens and you have to use this rule on two previous lines. You should have two previous lines, one which says little s is a consequence and another one which says s implies t is a consequence. Then you can conclude that t is a consequence of capital S. Is this clear? Okay. Now, the most important definition. A proof or a formal proof, yeah, more precisely, is a finite set of finite list, maybe I should use the word list of sequence. Now, yeah, let us come to our senses properly. If we are thinking about any proof, do you go on and on and on, you finish after a finite amount of time. Every single statement that you make in mathematics that either follows from the hypothesis which is a non-logical axiom or something which is a logical axiom, it is always true. It was proved elsewhere or it is always true because we have uh, like it is part of our mathematical axioms or it was deduced from two pre previous sentences. We combined two previous arguments to give a new argument. That is how every single mathematical proof is written. Of course, in reality, the rules of inference could change. Yeah, we, it might become more complicated. Our, our ordinary mathematical proofs are much more complicated. As I already mentioned, we are studying propositional logic. So, this is the baby version of logic. But you can understand the idea. Every formal proof has finite length. I mean, it could be 100 pages, but 100 pages is still finite. We cannot go on and on. Right? Whatever rules we have. So, for example, induction we assume. So, we can write proof using induction. But for any argument, we either rely on our hypothesis or something that cannot be questioned. And we deduce new things from existing things. Right? So, uh, even uh, let us recall Cantor's theorem. We start with some set and then we argue about that set that if this happens, then that happens. If this happens, then that happens and then we conclude something using contradiction over there. But this if and then, all these things in a very crude sense, they are one of these three. Either it is a rule of inference or it is a hypothesis 
or it's an axiom. Okay, so for the first time you are looking at the definition of a proof. Okay, now just saying this is not enough, I have to give you an example. So let us do an example of a formal proof. Okay, so suppose L is equal to P Q R. Writing down formal proofs is notoriously hard in this particular Hilbert style calculus. Okay, because you have to use your imagination how to introduce new variables. Yeah, I will show you with an example. But proving completeness theorem is very easy with Hilbert style system. That is why I have chosen this over natural deduction. Okay. So, suppose L is equal to PQR and we will show this. If P implies Q and Q implies R are given, then what would you like to show? P implies R. Very good. So, whenever we are writing down a formal proof of this statement, this sequent, then it should be a finite list of sequents such that the last sequent is precisely this. That is the meaning of writing a formal proof. And we are going to label a uh, number, not label, number each line of the proof. Okay? So, let us write down the first line. What can you say if you are given P implies Q and Q implies R? What can you conclude from there? P implies Q. P, P implies Q, not both simultaneously. Yes, we have to be very slow. Second one, I am not going to write this side. I am just going to put ditto. Yeah, I have to write a reason. Yeah, I cannot proceed without reason. So, this is a non-logical axiom. Because I assumed it, I concluded it. The second one is of course going to be Okay, what would be the third one? I still cannot use anything like modus ponens because I do not have the right setup and I have already exhausted all NLAs. So, now I have to rely on logical axioms. Now, let me quickly take you back. Which logical axiom do you think could be useful here? Second one. And tell me what are ST and U? P, Q and? If I use P implies Q implies R implies P implies Q implies P implies R, okay, fine. I am just going to write down because she said so. Okay. So, P implies Q implies R implies, well, uh, for, for some time do not write it. Yeah, let us experiment and then we will, after finalizing, we will write it. I mean, this seems okay. Yeah, because ultimately we are going to get P implies R. And we will need two applications of modus ponens. Can you see that? First application to re get rid of this part and the second application to get rid of this part. Okay, now this part can be gotten rid of because we already have line 1. But how to get rid of this part? We have to use line 2 somehow. So, let me first write down this is LA2. So, we have to get rid, uh, we have to use this to obtain the first part of line 3. Any ideas? I am going to go back here. 
I have already told you the first one is the magic one. It introduces new things without any problem. So, what if I choose S to be Q implies R and P, uh, uh, P to be T? Then I will get it. Can you see? Now, this is something which you have to do yourself. So, Q implies R implies P implies Q implies R. If I write this, this is LA1, then I am done. I mean, now I can see the entire proof. Any questions why we chose this? Okay, now you can start writing again. So, now, uh, now the rest of the proof is fairly straightforward. I have to use, uh, I have to first conclude P implies Q implies R and this is by using modus ponens on previous two lines. Which two lines? Four and two. two and four. So, we write MP24. Do not write any single line without number and justification. Okay, sixth one. So, once we have P implies Q implies R, what can you conclude? See, this part is same as the first part of line 3. So, I should use modus ponens. So, I should say P implies Q implies P implies R and I am going to use MP 3, 5. And then finally, I am going to use modus ponens again on line number 1 and 6. Okay, so we have concluded what we wanted. And this is a proof. It is a 7 line proof. Okay, those who like to solve puzzles, this is the best way to solve puzzles. Yeah, I mean finding out formal proofs of statements which are obviously true, it is notoriously hard, believe me. <laughs> okay, any questions about this? Yes. Less than 7 lines, only 3 lines, only 2 lines, I have no idea. I mean, this is the shortest proof that I can come up with. So, I, I do not want to say anything about the length. As long as the length is finite, you are okay. And there could be different proofs. Yeah? There could be multiple proofs of the same statement. Okay. Now, I am going to write down some lemmas. Yeah? And those lemmas will have numbers because we are going to refer to them later in the proof of completeness theorem. So, uh, th the first lemma is your tutorial uh, problem. Okay, so, I am going to write lemma 1. And it simply says this. There is a proof of S implies S. S implies S, is that a tautology? So, now notice something. It is a tautology, so you want to derive a tautology from the given tautologies because there are no NLAs. The left hand side is empty. So, no NLAs, only use logical axioms means only use tautologies from the given set of tautologies to conclude other tautologies. So, that is why this is called, I mean this is also not an easy task. Yeah, try this out before uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow we will see the solution anyway, but try it out yourself. This is a like possibly the simplest looking statement, but the proof is not easy. Okay. Another thing, yeah. Uh, 
so finite character of proof lemma okay so what uh, oh by the way i think this is a right time to talk about something some question that that's always in uh, students minds but nobody answers it properly what is the difference between a theorem a lemma and a proposition and a corollary okay so uh, if you are writing a book a paper if you are uh, studying for a course then a theorem is a statement which you should never forget it has independent value okay now this is not i am not giving you any mathematical explanation i am telling you how things normally work in the mathematical community theorems are statements which you should never forget can you tell me any theorem from calculus course which you should always remember fundamental theorem of fundamental theorem of calculus yeah it's a theorem you should never forget that then rose theorem mean value theorem usually they also have some names now here we are going to write down several lemmas so lemma uh, the plural of lemma is lemmata so uh, i mean in practice this is the greek plural uh, sorry latin plural but we also use lemmas so uh, lemmas are important steps they are key steps in the proofs of theorems but they are of independent interest uh, they are, they use lot of notation so they are usually only of interest for writing the proof of a theorem so they are tools developed on the way so normally you call an argument a lemma you separate it out from the main proof if it is used at least twice yeah or it is of independent interest and propositions are those statements which are small results but they are independent okay so if you want to give something like suppose you end up writing a paper then usually the important results will be called theorems while you are proving theorems you are giving some definitions and after those definitions you want to prove some consequences some simple things about the new terms you have developed those will be propositions and lemmas are techniques or tools that you develop on the way in order to prove theorems corollaries are consequences yeah so if there is a statement of a theorem or a proposition or a lemma and then a simple consequence of that statement i mean simple doesn't really mean the proof is very short always it could be long but the essential ingredient is that statement the earlier statement in that proof then it is called a corollary there is also some word which has been forgotten it's called a scolium s c h l o uh, s c h o l i u m scolium so scoliums are usually consequences of proofs so basically it's a corollary of the proof of the above statement yeah it doesn't follow from the statement alone it follows from the proof of the statement people generally don't use it but yeah uh, one of my good friends and professors he he taught me about this that scoliums used to be a thing in the past okay let's come back here so uh, now i'm going to state this finite character of proof lemma so it says that if 
S is a subset of SL and T is in SL, then there is a finite set S naught containing uh, contained inside S such that S naught proves T. Can you tell me a proof of this statement? Finite character of proof. So, capital S could be potentially infinite and if T is a consequence of capital S, then actually T is a consequence of a finite subset of capital S. Why is that the case? Because proofs, are finite. proofs are finite, yes. Next statement. <coughs> Length of a proof is finite, obviously. So, therefore, how many NLAs can you use? So, done. You only choose those elements of capital S which are used as NLAs. The rest of them are irrelevant. Right? So, I am not writing a proof. Finite character of proof. Yeah, I mean it only follows from a finite set of assumptions. You don't need infinitely many of them. Okay. Let us do the next thing. So, monotonicity, okay. uh, here we are talking about the set of consequences of a, cap of a given set of propositional formulas. So, capital S is given, okay. then uh, there is a bunch of consequences of capital S. I am going to use this notation. Yeah? Uh, suppose, S is a subset of S prime and S prime is a subset of SL and T is in SL. If there is a proof of T from S, then there is a proof of T from S prime. Why is it called monotonicity? Yeah, maybe I should explain that. So, in other words, if these angular brackets denote the collection of all the things which can be proved from T, then S subset of S prime implies that the angular bracket of S is angular bracket of uh, is contained inside angular bracket of S prime. This angular bracket this is called the deductive closure. of S. Okay, why deductive closure? Uh, can you tell me what is the relationship between S and its deductive closure? It is the filter generated by, but S itself is contained inside deductive closure. Yes? Why? Loudly. NLA, yes, NLA, right. So, every single formula in capital S is a non-logical axiom. So, you have a one-line proof of that. 
So therefore, S is certainly contained inside its deductive closure. And monotonicity says that if S is contained inside S prime, then deductive closure of S is also contained inside deductive closure of S prime. By the way, this filter idea, yeah, that hasn't been shown yet. You are, when you say that uh, this is, this is precisely the filter generated by capital S, you are using the logical cons uh, logical equivalence classes of S, which is a totally semantic notion. Here we are still talking about purely syntactic notion. So once we prove completeness theorem, then this thing will be same as the other uh, monotonicity or this will be the filter generated by the logical uh, logical equivalence classes of formulas in capital S. Yeah, so right now, this does not mean anything. It is simply the set of formulas which have a proof from capital S. So, completeness theorem will say that single turnstile and double turnstile are exactly the same. Yeah, so in fact, we started it here. Yeah, lemma 1 is the first lemma which we will need for the proof of the completeness theorem. Then finite character is also something very useful. Monotonicity which we will need. Yeah, so all these things we are going to uh, write. Okay. The, uh, you are supposed to write the proof of this. Yeah, monotonicity for a tutorial. And I will give you the hint, it is induction on the line number of the proof, okay. Perhaps tomorrow also I will only say that, <laughs> okay. Now uh, we will start with the proof of a next important result and that is why I am calling it a theorem, it is called deduction theorem. So, suppose we have already seen the semantic version of this. Yeah, suppose S is a subset of SL, S and T are elements of SL, then uh, there is a proof of S implies T from capital S if and only if there is a proof of T from S union capital S single sorry capital S union singleton small s. We have seen the double turnstile version of this. Yeah, I mean you are simply transferring this S back and forth and that is allowed. But the semantic version has a very simple proof. The syntactic version we have supposed to do lot of work here. Okay? So uh, I will finish proving one side today and next thing we will do next week. Okay. So, uh, we suppose we have a proof, we have a proof of S implies T from capital S. Then I just want to increase the size of the left hand side. What is the way to do that? <coughs> Loudly? No, 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 not LA1. Just look here, it is here, monotonicity, you want to add more hypothesis. Yeah, so that is allowed. So, start with a proof. And use monotonicity. To 
replace the LHS of each line uh, of each uh, line by S union singleton S. Any problem here? I am just adding more one more hypothesis little s okay to obtain a proof of capital S union singleton small s proves S implies T. Now how do I obtain? What do I want? I want a proof of S union singleton S proves T. How do I obtain it from here? I have this. Huh? Modus ponens on what? I do not have two statements yet. We can use NLA, right? So add two lines. What is the first line S union and then done. So one side is quite simple. Yeah, uh, so this side of the proof is done now. So we obtained the proof of just T from this. Okay, the other side is what is more complicated. Okay, so suppose I am going to start it today. S union singleton S proves T. So, uh, the idea here is that now you have a proof a finite proof. We are again going to use induction on the line and we are going to replace each line by finitely many lines. Okay, we will replace each line by finitely many other lines so that in total I will again have a finite union of finite set of lines which means a finite proof, yeah, that is important, I always need a finite proof, but our idea would be that we do not want S union singleton S on the left hand side, we always need just capital S on the left hand side. Okay, so uh, let me write down, so we replace each line of the proof by uh, finitely many uh, lines with S in the LHS and use induction. Okay, how many cases would there be? What are the two base cases of this? First thing would be, there are two base cases, LA and NLA and then the inductive case is MP. Okay, so let us do that. So, so base case 1. Okay, so that is LA. Suppose line number I is the sequent, every line is a sequent. Yeah, I mean, I am uh, using this. Then 
replace it with was there anything to be done here because logical axiom is a consequence of anything yeah that's our um, original idea so therefore there was nothing to be done uh, but oh i mean uh, sorry there is something to be done see what we need is this so we have to replace it with an appropriate line so let me just take two more minutes so okay this is my la1 so ti was itself a logical axiom and that was a consequence of s union singleton s now i am using la1 for this and using la1 now i can conclude this mp on the above two lines so i replaced this particular sequent yeah i mean this underlined sequent by three lines i had s little s on the left hand side and i pushed it to the right hand side that's how we are going to do it with remaining base cases and inductive case okay so let us stop for today